What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Today is a good day. We are so excited to have Loretta Terozaita on the program today. Never heard of Loretta? Well, you know we've got you covered. We're talking executive presence, how to be a better communicator, leveraging tools like video, and what happens when you just need the master cleaner to come and spruce things up. Loretta is a speaker, coach, former news anchor, yep, that's right, an entrepreneur specializing in helping leaders, especially tech leaders, elevate. We are on a roll here at TCB, and this conversation, well, friends, I think you're going to dig it. So buckle up, TCBers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Loretta Terozaita on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender, where we gather some of the best HR and people leaders to discuss what's happening on the people side of business. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. Welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday. You know what that means. It's your favorite day and mine. It is Corporate Bartender Day. It is the 4th of April 2024. I marvel at the passage of time every time. We are into Q2. Q1 is gone, which means it's going to be summer soon and then Halloween and then we'll be doing the holiday thing before you know it. And yeah, Ruby's giving that a double thumbs down. She's trying to make a Zoom thunderstorm. There it is. There it is. Uh, it is the 191st time that we have convened this group of awesome people, and today is going to be a fun day. Today, we have a guest. She's the person that you don't recognize up there and has been remarkably quiet so far. <laughs> That's going to change, soaking my in. friends. <laughs> That's going to change. Uh, her name is Loretta Terrazaita. And I've been trying to Perfect. pronounce that Lithuanian name for several months now, and I still don't think I nailed it, but you're very kind, Loretta. L Loretta is, uh, is going to talk to us today about up-leveling our executive presence, being crisp and clear, and telling our stories and communications. And, uh, and she's just a hoot, so we're going to have a good time. But before we get into that content, I want to point you to some upcoming guests. We have Dean Innes on the show next week on the 10th of April. He is the managing partner of a company called Your Best Life Now, which I thought was pretty cool. He uh, has this method where he merges all of your ideas about finances and family and fitness and faith. There's a lot of alliteration. Um, to get to maximizing your best life right now. And I thought, well, I could use that. So I think you guys could probably be, probably benefit from that as well. Uh, on the 17th, we've got Pat Taggart. He, this guy's super fun. He runs a, a video company. And uh, when I got pitched on this one, I was like, mm, I don't know. It seems a little bit out of our lane. And he wanted to talk. So I talked to him and his ways of using video to tell stories and up level, you know, your HR brand, your company's brand and have just these profound impacts. I thought it was great. I love the guy. He's got a ton of energy. So that's going to be fun as well. That's the 17th. And then as they do the travel gods, they speaketh. Uh, <laughs> TCB will be dark April 24th and May 1st as I will be somewhere that is not here. So, <laughs> That's the skinny about what's coming up, but it's time to talk to Loretta. So Loretta Terezaita, she is the founder and CEO of Loretta Today, where she helps technology companies in need of transition to effectively manage the fast moving growth stage that comes with success. We talk about executive presence in our work uh, with people in HR and talent development and, uh, you know, We've been around those people that don't have executive presence. We've been around those people for whom it comes really naturally. So we're going to pick Loretta's brain about what she's learned in her journey here. But we should bring her in here in our traditional way. Let's give her a big TCB welcome, shall we? 
Yeah, see, I don't stop the music until the guest starts dancing. So nice work. <laughs> Welcome, Loretta. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Super excited to be here and super excited to engage with everybody who's attending today, you know, and and I wanted to kind of also mention that if, if anybody has any questions around what I'm saying, obviously chime in, jump in, you know, ask me to clarify anything and I'll be happy to answer and guide. Excellent. Well, so our journeys, we always like to start by learning a little bit about your history and your story. And I imagine that when you were a wee child, this isn't where you pictured yourself. This isn't what you thought you were going to be. What did you want to be? And tell us how you got here. You know, specifically, I never thought I was going to be an executive coach or marketing and communications executive myself, but I did know very early on that I wanted to be in television. So that started, I don't know how long ago, uh, I was probably 10, nine years of age where I would be sitting in front of the national, like the television in front of the, and watching the national news that was airing every night. And I kept telling my parents, one day I will be that person. One day I will be that anchor. One day I will be there myself. Mm -hmm. Obviously parents would laugh it off and, and, and treat that as a child nonsense. Right. But somehow I don't know where I got that vision in my head. It happened, you know, and in the end, you know, all my journey that uh, that took me to the anchoring, you know, was by choosing the right career, being in journalism, because I'm a communicator by nature. So that natural skill that I had all along kind of translated through the anchoring career first, you know, being a journalist, a, a news reporter, a news anchor. And then because it's about communication, because it's about the presence, how you appear, how you communicate, how can you relate to the audience that trickle down and everything else I've done, you know, moving here from from Lithuania to United States, um, you know, I've reshaped uh, the journalism into video storytelling. So funny, you, you mentioned uh, the upcoming guest, you know, that's that's how I started. That's how I reshaped, you know, I was a video producer, uh, uh, you know, video storyteller first, yeah, you know, and that's how I sort of helped uh, um, executives get better in using that medium, you know, using the camera, being uh, clear on how they want to talk, you know, and how they want to engage with their audience. So that's kind of in a short, in a short um, um, snapshot, you know, my, my path to where I am right now, you know, as part of the executive presence coach. Yes. In the pre-show, we were talking about music. Oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. I may have not mentioned something that prompted you to ask this question. <laughs> we were talking about music because, you know, obviously it's a thing for me. And, uh, you know, you asked questions about what I did and what Lori's done in, in that realm. And you shared with us that your father took you on a musical journey when you were a middle school aged person, but it was an atypical, non-traditional musical journey. Tell us a little bit about the instrument that you played as a tween. Yes, I played an accordion and I hated it to the core. I was good at it, but I hated it so much because it was such not a feminine instrument. It was bulky, it was big, and I'm this little child trying to, <laughs> to navigate around it, you know, to use my fingers on both sides, you know? So uh, in the end, you know, um, I ended up, you know, secretly dropping it without my parents knowing, and then they learned from the teacher that I was skipping classes, you know, <laughs> of the accordion, uh, you know, classes. and. And, and it dwindled down. But now as I'm an adult, you know, I, I kind of regret it. I mean, I was good at it. I could have fostered it. But my dream was like, Lori, you know, plays piano. I've always seen piano as an elegant instrument. It's just the the, the flavor of it, right? I've always wanted to play uh, um you know, a, uh, a, a a piano as an instrument, but I was never brave enough to tell that to my parents because they said, no, you're playing the accordion and that's it. And you know, coming from an Eastern European country, you really don't push back on your parents. You just do what they told you to do. <laughs> well, I love it. And who says that the accordion is not an elegant instrument? I mean, come on. I know, I know. I've watched a lot of women later on in my life playing accordions and dancing to your point, right. <laughs> you know, while playing. And I'm like, wow, you know, they it's just good. It just sounds good. It's a very unique sound, you know, and they, there's masters of accordions. Sure. And you know, uh, an accordion gig like that, that's probably 2,500, 3,000 calories burned cardio wise. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was not part of my concern back when I was a child. 
<laughs> so you moved here from Lithuania. I'm curious, right? Since communication is your focus and and you were you were a TV anchor in mm -hmm. in your home country. Um what are the biggest starkest communication differences that you noticed mm. between, you know, Eastern Europe where you grew up and getting here? What what are the big things that are different from a communications perspective? There's a couple of flavors that I can discuss, right? So first and foremost, you know, the, the journalism, the TV aspect, right? I was raised very, not raised, I studied a very traditional approach of journalism. You know, you don't share your emotions on the screen. You don't express your opinions, you know, you always check, you know, different different facts from different sources, but you never show what you think, right? So I came from this, uh, from this type of training, you know, as a news anchor and, uh, um, when we moved here and when I started consuming more and more American type of, you know, news, <laughs> so to say, it became news. very clear that it's not really news. <laughs> it's really entertainment. <laughs> Everybody can just badger anybody they want, you know, on TV <laughs> screen. So I was like in shock. How how is that even allowed? Right. How is that possible? And why is nobody, you know, uh, saying like there's there's, you know, communication or journalism standards. Right. That I had adhered to adhere to back in my country. Like, why is nobody, you know, canceling this program or why? Why is that like that? But, you know, obviously I understood that this is the way it's done and, and this is how it is. Right. So at that point, it was very clear that I will never be part of that culture, you know, as as even though I had that that journalism background. <clears throat> I was never going to be able to embed into that community uh, because I, I did not have historical knowledge of different things that were happening in the United States, you know, where you can actually have that banter on screen and have all, all these facts and things, you know, in your head that you can refer back to. So I said, you know what, career's over. Uh, let's move on. So that's a little bit of that, um, you know, <laughs> perspective of the journalism. <laughs> <laughs> on the journalism aspect, right? And the news anchoring difference uh, when it comes to communications. Now, corporate was a different world for me. <clears throat> So when I moved here with my husband, my husband is also Lithuanian, so we moved together and he was the one who actually got the job offer, you know, as an expat and exchange program, you know, between the two companies. Mm -hmm. And I came in as a wife, so I could not work. So I was not oh. exposed to corporate world for a long, long time, you know, until I started my business in 2010. And that's when I started learning the networking, the the people, the groups, like how, how that whole infrastructure works, right? And I remember... When I was talking to my client, one of my potential clients early on, I was, you know, the producer, the videographer, I was five people in one, you know, kind of figuring it out. And uh, and a potential client called me on the phone and I hung up, I finished talking and my husband, you know, says, so who did you talk to? I said, my client. And he's like, is that how you talk to them? I said, well, what did I say wrong? He's like, well, you're very harsh and abrupt. I said, <laughs> Hello, I don't Eastern know what Europe. that means, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm different here or on the phone or anywhere. Right. But that's, you know, he has gone, he has had already like five years of that American corporate, you know, under his belt, right. right. Communication did, you know, uh, how do you position certain conversations? Right. And I didn't have any of that. Right. I've learned throughout the years, but I think I'm still very direct <laughs> <laughs> how I communicate that Eastern European comes out. And a lot of, you know, when I worked with executives, uh, you know, in corporate environments, you know, they actually appreciated that aspect mm -hmm. because, hey, Loretta, you're just not BSing around. You just no tell bullshit. us how it is. Yeah. You're saving our time and just we move on. You know, we improve from that direct, you know, back and forth feedback, you know, and and we're, we don't have to scratch our heads thinking, you know, what are we doing wrong? Yeah. So so I guess it all depends on the intake. You know, I, I'm currently working with a lot of people who are from different cultures and they are very sensitive to that directness. They don't understand it. You know, they see it as American, although I am Eastern European. You know, that comes from another type of culture as well right yeah. so it depends <laughs> you know that's kind of my personal style and a lot of people yeah. get scared but at the same time you know that uh that corporate language that uh, sort of um being polite around things was never something i fully adopted honestly <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It's, it's but I, though. through observation, have seen that this is very different than how, you know, in Lithuania, people communicate. It's just different, you know. So so that's that's that, you know, uh, that I noticed. I, I imagine that. that I imagine that gives you an edge over other 
coaches in in the same space that people really resonate with, right? To to say, hey, there kind of is a lot of BS that happens <laughs> in the in the in the corporate, you know, politics and all the things. And how can you actually be more efficient, effective, still playing within the rules, but kind of cut to the chase or, you know, up level. Yeah, yeah it, it all depends, you know, on that receiving end as well, right? I, I can recognize them. I'm not going to be likable by everybody, you know, but if people write, like my energy, like my speed, like how I communicate, you know, like, hey, I'm thinking right now, no. And I literally cut it off and I say, stop <laughs> right now. We do it this way. <laughs> and, you know, some people, to some people, it's a shock. It's like, oh my God, you know, she, mm -hmm. she doesn't care about my feelings, you know, but mm -hmm. some people really appreciate that. They're like, okay. Saving yeah. time, saving money. What do you want me to do? You know, so it it all depends. So I'm not I'm not there for everybody, honestly. Sure. <laughs> I'm tired already, just <laughs> trying to keep up. <laughs> so we, we we talk about this concept of executive presence, and and you know I worked in in HR for twenty plus years. Lori is the chief people officer. A lot of the folks who tune in to the show work in and around HR, and we spend a lot of time coaching our executives, right? Our client executives and executive presence is a term that's been around a while. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those platitudes that I think means different things to different people. So what does it mean to you? Let's define that before we talk about making it better or up leveling it as it were. Yeah. So executive presence can mean for, uh, uh, the way I look at it in any stage of the career of a person, right? That executive meaning is different for them and that, and in, in depending which career stage, they're, stage they're in, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say early stage executive, no, not executive, I wouldn't call them executives, but let's say managers, right? <clears throat> sure. In the corporate environment, let's, let's take corporate environment as an example, you know, I'm not going to go into startups. I'm not going to go into any of that. Yeah. Let's take corporate environment as, as a standard, right? So there's a, individual contributors, there's, you know, people, managers, and there's obviously C-suite, VPs, and all of that, right? So uh, obviously, when you're in the C-suite already, when you're in that VP level, you get a lot of that coaching that you're talking about, right? You, there's already programs, learning programs, you know, how to manage people, how to be out, how to give the feedback, you know, you, you, you're you being taught how to talk to media, you're being taught how to do the presentations on stage, you're being invited to keynotes, and all of, all of that, that represents the company very well. So that's this, like, aspirational goal that people who are in early stages of the career are aspiring, or some of them, I should say, are aspiring to get to, right? They see these executives on stage and they're like, oh my God, they're awesome. Oh, they know what they're talking about. Oh my God, they give this a perfect sound bite, you know, to media. Oh, their article, you know, in the interview was amazing, right? So it's an image of that presence that the executive exudes externally, but as well as internally. So in town halls, for example, how does the executive walk in the stage? How does he greet somebody? Does he pay attention? to people or is he or she all about them just themselves right so it's a cumulative thing when you're at that stage that plays a role of what executive presence is now if you're an individual contributor if you're a middle role type of manager and you're just looking at admiring these leaders you know inside or outside of the organization you, you sometimes get stuck because really there's no such thing as we're going to train you to be an executive right now. <laughs> so you're an executive right now, and now we're going to train you how to be, you know, better as an executive, right? But there's no path to getting to the executive level, so to say, through different communication mediums, right? It's how to lead the team, maybe, you know, how to be a good and effective leader, communicator. But how do you represent yourself so that you're this executive material, Right. So that's, I think, where these uh, individual contributors who want to get into people management roles or middle level managers, you know, struggle the most with because they're just not being exposed to these terminologies, to these things, to what what how can they get unstuck, you know, in where their go aspirational goals are in terms of career and what should they be doing to get themselves there? Right. To get themselves to that level. Sometimes, you know, you're one day you're you're an in individual contributor. Next day you're managing teams and it's like swimming, you know, and trying to figure out how to do that, right? Nobody really, uh, I shouldn't say nobody, majority of the companies yeah. don't think about these, you know, um, that growth path. How do yeah. you grow in, a, in somebody into an executive role, you know, well, let, inside an organization? A bit of, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because um, Lori works in a technology organization. I spent most of my career working for technology organizations, uh, my past almost 13 years here at Sky Team, we work with a lot of technology organizations and we see this phenomenon happen a lot. I'm a really good technical person. I'm a fantastic 
engineer, developer, whatever. Um, I do a lot of cool stuff. I, 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 as an individual contributor, am a subject matter expert. And as a reward for being so good at my job, I am given a job managing people, something that I probably don't know how to do, never been trained in it. I might not even want it, but it's the way you move up in the organization. And if I take that first manager bump and I don't cause any problems and there's nothing, nothing gets broken, chances <laughs> are in three or four years, I'm going to get promoted to director yeah. and then to senior director and then to VP. And then I find myself leading a business unit or something, a division. Um, and I still don't have those skills. It wasn't ever on my list of things to want to be, but now I'm here and I'm expected to be good at it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I may, I may have opinions about whether it's necessary or not. How do you approach clients like that? Who it wasn't always their aspiration to get the big corner office and be in charge of everybody, but here they are and they just don't have it right. They weren't mm -hmm. born with it. Mm -hmm. How do you approach you are, that? By the way, few are born with it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you <true>. are. <laughs> yeah, few are. <laughs> it's true. So how do you approach situations like that with those types of leaders? You know, um, any individual aspiration or drive also influences, you know, if, if they're going to get there or not. So my process, you know, you had a picture of me and it said real relating lens, right? So I, I normally go through the process of understanding, right? Well, okay, you were just promoted, you're managing people, you were so good at this, but you're not really good at that. And you, you, you really don't know what you're doing, right? First for me is important, do they even want to get there? Right. Do they even want to be at that executive level? Or maybe they're just happy to be in this middle manager role because not a lot of people want to get themselves there. Right. So what can we do to get you better in your middle manager role as a leader? Right. So we go through this process of a little bit of self-discovery. You know, I've asked a bunch of questions, you know, and I have this questionnaire that actually a lot of your audience people can can download you and it's on my website, Loretta.today. Loretta with one T dot today. And, uh, uh, and, you know, it's a self-assessment, right? So if you, if you're a, a, a manager or an executive or aspiring one, you know, take this questionnaire, it gives you like a good Intel where you're at based on what I understand an executive presence is, right? Are you being invited to different meetings? Are you being noticed? Are you, are you, do you network, right? Inside and outside of the organization. A lot of people who are heavy engineers, they don't think about that. They don't think about what the network means to them in their career, you know? How these relationships actually indirectly impact you know, if they're going to advance or not advance in their career, right? So a lot of that discovery is like the first three steps, di diving deep, you know, uh, understanding the goals and objectives, you know, and then defining sort of uh, uh, what are the opportunity gaps, right? What should we start working on with you to reach that minimal or maximum goal that you have, you know, as as, as a leader, right? And then we go and, and start, you know, implementing different strategies. Okay, d how do you present in the, in, the, in the meetings, you know, how to show me, you know, it's a little bit more of this, uh, interactive, right? I want to see how they present in, in virtual meetings. I want to see how they present on stage. I want to see their, you know, their decks. I want to hear how they communicate, you know. I challenge them to, you know, do something on LinkedIn, you know, that's professional, you know, uh, that markets them, but at the same time, a company, uh, uh, you know, by the extension, right? How do they start building their own uh, personal brand, you know, that aligns with their mission and their values that are inside of them, uh, and uh, as well as, you know, with where they want to be as, as leaders. So, so, uh, so that's how I, I approach this. And it doesn't matter which level of, of leadership they're in. It's the same process with anybody at work. Organizational level, individual level is the same process that I follow because that's how I start analyzing and seeing the gaps and identifying these uh, opportunities for them. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So I have a question about, we you know, talking about tech companies who traditionally have fewer women, right? The demographics are very skewed towards men. And so then that whole get a seat at the table and progress in your career and be taken seriously. I, I would imagine your your assessment phase is very similar regardless. But then do you find that there's different you, you have to coach different ways for women who are maybe the significant minority in the air, you know, the world that they're trying to grow into? You know, I, I was asked a similar question about a couple of weeks ago, you know, and uh, and uh, I will share what I believe in, 
and it has nothing to do with gender, <laughs> you know, differences, yeah. right? Yeah. If if you have the drive, if that's your aspiration, you will find the ways to get there, you know, either you will seek that knowledge yourself or you will find help to get there, right? Uh, but I do not always see, you know, black and white, oh, a man is better than a woman. No. How do they perform? Uh, how they communicate? How do they come across? These are all obtainable skills, you know, mm -hmm. to your point. Nobody was born, you know, like out of the womb. I'm now an executive. You, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you go through your life experiences, then you weave into your stories, you weave into your examples, you 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 grow as a, a, as an authority right in your industry. And that all is despite of what gender you are, you know, it's, uh, I don't, I don't find, you know, adapting my, my uh, coaching, you know, on the gender. However, what I do, uh, you know, try to uncover is if there is a, a psychological block right. in them themselves right. that yeah. prevents them from, you know, pushing, pushing themselves into that direction, being afraid, fearful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not using the camera because they, they, they're they afraid to be judged, not posting anything because, you know, there's the whole world is going to judge them and maybe they, they're going to lose a bonus, whatever. I, I'm making things up right now. Uh, yeah. but, but, but I don't adapt the process. It's just understanding where the person is when they start working with me. And I, I love that because I, I think that's so true that sometimes I mean, I think that there are real barriers culturally in some organizations that are more systemic, you know, and, and those 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 are going to be hard to deal with anyways. But I think for the most part, it's limiting beliefs in ourselves that are the bigger barriers than any company culture barriers. And so it's just, you know, stride purposefully, man, just. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we all have limiting beliefs. Like I have limiting beliefs, you know, we all have limiting beliefs, you know, but, but when we see somebody who is so good on stage or so good as an executive, we think they're, they just got it. <laughs> they didn't, <it. laughs> you know, I have numerous examples when I, an executive would walk into the studio to do an interview with me. And he'd be like, oh, I got it. You know, I do presentations all the time, you know, on stage, but they don't understand that video is actually different, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when I start working with them and they're not getting, giving the 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 concise sound bites the way that it works for video, they start realizing and they start sweating and they're like, uh, it, they start losing confidence, right? It's like, <laughs> my God, I walked in knowing what I'm doing and now I'm like, a total fool because I have no idea what I'm doing. Right? right. So, so my job is to help them understand as well. The difference, you know, that stage presence is very different than on camera presence. You know, mm -hmm. you have to understand the distances of the camera. How do you communicate? If you're on, on a spot on interview, you know, in an event, you know, somebody like a blogger or whoever comes and says, Hey, I heard you on stage. Can you give me a soundbite here on the camera? Right. They have to know how camera works. They have to know where they need to look. Right. Do they talk to the person? Do they look at the lens? Because it's completely different um, vibe, you know, depending where you look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And say, what stage, you know, do you fill in the stage or do you just walk, you know, your, your head down and mumble <laughs> under your mouth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. That's great. It's so yeah. funny to hear you, to hear you say this. I was, I was having a conversation today with a coaching client and she's German. And we were having this conversation about some DEI initiatives that are happening inside that organization. And like the literal nature of how she processes it, she's like, I just don't understand. Just do your job, right? Show up and do your job. And I'm like, man, that is so German of you to say right now. <laughs> um, and I, I, I appreciate it because it's, it's this, it's how you show up. It's the headspace in which you show up. And she, you know, she's worked all over the world. She's seen a lot of things and she's like, everybody's different. Some of these, these initiatives that, that the company's trying to put into place involve defining terms. And she's like, look, you can spend a lot of time defining terms and it still means something different to me than it does to you. 100%. Yeah. Like <laughs> idiomatically, she's like, my, my baseline is German. It's all different. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's, I don't, I listen to them tell me things and I'm like, I, it doesn't even make sense to me because it doesn't line up with my history, experience and upbringing. That is, that is so true. You know, everybody has their default thinking, right? We all have our own experiences that make us think about different things in a default manner, right? If I see something written one way, I will take it in completely differently than you see it written sure. a certain way. I literally had an example from last night, you know, there was an email that came out and I added somebody to that email chain 
you know, where where somebody else's name was mentioned in a manner where, you know, to somebody it appeared that it's a derogatory. And I'm like, that's not how I read it at all. I think we're just I think that other person was just calling out and, uh, you know, that the person in reference, you know, just has the expertise to actually fix the things. It's not the, the reverse. So we just took the same message completely differently and then we aligned and then they're like oh yeah loretta yeah you're right you know you're actually right that's that's actually the real way of how that email came across so we all have these default thinkings you know and and the cult cultural how we were raised you know what content we consume you know who we observe who we read who we listen to and we just have that default where no matter what you're telling me i'm just hearing it one way that's it you know uh, it just it requires a lot more explanation, and and, and you all know, you know, being uh, being in, in an in chart environment, you know, you you go through a leadership training of some sorts, right? And uh, everybody gets away with different perspective of what that training gave to them, right? Did they learn anything, or was it nonsense? <laughs> <to them>? Right. <laughs> we all waste of time. Many, all depends on how many Germans were in the room at the time. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. so, so thinking about that, just sort of building upon what you just said there, thinking about being clear, right? Because we hear this a lot with executive training and this notion of building and up leveling our executive presence. It's being clear and crisp in our communications. So are there any sort of rules of thumb that apply to everybody in that space, trying to be crisp and clear with our communications as executive leaders? Yes, I guess one thing is just don't assume that you that that your knowledge that, that the audience has the same knowledge as you. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. You know, if you're con connecting with people, employees or on stage under assumption that everybody has the same information like your head has. <laughs> then you will fail in communicating what you're trying to communicate. Because again, back to the default thinking, right? Everybody has only that their perspective, their knowledge, their, their ability to connect the dots, right? So you always have to assume that you're at that level because of your experience. And if you're right. communicating, you're communicating with people who are less experienced in the field that you are. So, so you have to tone down and you have to simplify the language, the terminologies, remove all the acronyms. You know, I literally personally also had the same situation where I, I, I brought uh, on board uh, one of the project managers, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, we had to drive certain initiatives. And I said, Hey, we have to produce this video. And the editor was assigned to that video. So I'm, in my head, that editor is knows the process, right? right? Knows, understands the timelines, understands what the deliverables are. Three weeks in, I don't see the draft. And I'm like, well, where's the video? <laughs> by now I should be seeing at least, you know, two versions of the draft. And then I realized, you know, that I personally did not express clearly that by this date, I expect to see the draft because I know the process very well, what it takes to produce a video, how many revision rounds, you know, how picky I am and what I see when it comes to details, you know, and executing certain uh, uh, collateral, digital collateral, right? I see details that a lot of people don't sometimes. Sure. So I know my process, which means I need a certain amount of time to go through that nitpicking to the perfection, you know, where I'm happy to share with the stakeholders, right? So it has to be my process first. And I realized that I never communicated that to the editor. You know, I was just expecting he knows the process. He mm -hmm. knows the timelines. He understands how the video editing works and he'll just get it to me, you know, based on, on, on that same alignment, but we were so misaligned. I did not tell them what I was expecting. You know, I just assumed he understood the process the way I did. So, so uh, then it, it dawned on me. I'm like, okay, moving forward, I should just assume that nobody is in my head. That's it. Right. You know, <laughs> nobody's in my head. Right. <laughs> I yeah. have to tell them what's in my head. Yeah. Ruby just dropped in the chat. We call that making the implicit explicit. Mm. Um, Sometimes I call it contracting the obvious. It's a lot of these little interpersonal things that we assume will just figure themselves out. Mm -hmm. They don't. Right? Well, they just... and, and when you layer any sort of change initiative, change communication mm -hmm. into oh, that space, yeah. like that's like the first way to tank is any assumption that anybody gets it the way you do. Right. Oh, and that, yeah. you know, we, I'm, I'm always beating that drum to say, you know, we around this table have been talking about this for four months and we're far along in our understanding of why and all of the nuance and all of the moving parts that we've already considered. But the minute you deliver that message, they're they're at ground zero. 
Yeah. And so being frustrated that they don't get it is yeah. just, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a waste of time, you yeah. know, and, and that is very, very true. And especially in that transition period, you know, because I work with companies in that transition, that's my sweet spot. I really like cleaning up the mess. You know, I see executive <laughs> mess. I want to clean it up. I see company mess. I want to clean it up. You know, <laughs> I'm like a master cleaner in house and inside of organizations. So, uh, so I, 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 whenever I see those gaps, you know, either a process or communication, flow you know it's it's like well how do you expect somebody on the other side of the world to just ship something over to this side of the world with no instructions and then this side of the world to understand what you meant it's just not how it works you have to communicate you know and uh, and it's a lot about uh, uh building the processes building the information flow right how how does the executive you know, trickle down the information, all these internal executive communication, you know, programs that exist in some larger organizations who can afford them, right? They're very crucial in those, you know, transitional stages when let's say a company goes through this massive growth, you know, it's not six people anymore in the company, it's, you know, a thousand people. You can't just in the hall, in the passing in the call, you know, just talk and everybody's on board with everything. You really have to think, how do you reach all the new team members that are joining the company? You know, all the all the departmental leaders understand what you are driving, what the company initiatives are, right? How do you establish these communication programs so that everybody understands where the company is going, you know? And, and a lot of times executives are just busy, are just busy, right? They don't think about it. So they need teams and people who can tell them, hey, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, right? And it's a, a lot of buy-in and campaigning that needs to happen inside the organization for them to mm -hmm. to believe that this is an important you know thing to do yeah yep i'm i i always like myth busting you know when there's all these maxims and platitudes that exist and in, in every little niche here uh, and communications is no exception i'm going to ask you about one of them and i just want you to tell me is this true and does it hold up right okay so this communication maxim people tell me like when I, if I'm going to be an effective communicator, what I should do is tell them what I'm going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what I told them. I was told that like in the first communications training I was ever a participant in, and it makes sense to me, but I'm like, it seems like a lot of work. Is that a thing I have to do? <laughs> well, you know, in this day and age, you can tell the same mes message by using different mediums. You tell verbally, you tell in writing, you tell through video, you answer the same questions, you know, multiple times. You, you, you just make a variety of the same thing that feels like you're saying something different, but it's the same message through different avenues, right? So I do believe in the theory that you have to repeat before it sinks into people. But how do you deliver that message? We have so many options right now, you know, in, in doing so. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, I'm going to ask the hard question because... I, I know that as a coach, it's not always the best way, but it happens. I get brought in because somebody's not doing so well mm. and they need some help. Mm. Um, I can imagine that, uh, you know, we talk about those people that have it and those people that don't have it. I can imagine a situation in which somebody says, we need the master cleaner. We need Loretta um, <laughs> because our leader is an asshole. Just an asshole. And we got to get this fixed. How do you deal with that? Uh, well, of course, if you tell them we're going to clean you up, nobody's <laughs> going to want to acknowledge that. <laughs> no, you know what I always have told and my mantra is always, uh, you know, is this. If you bring me on board to to help with organizational processes, marketing communications function, establishing, building it out, whatever it is, executive, you know, presence, uh, up leveling, you know, literally I'm all in a hundred percent in to make you or that executive look good. It's not about that they're bad. It's it's just finding how to make them good with where they're at, right? Uncovering these layers that are blocking them and saying, hey, you're actually really good at telling these types of stories. You know, just tell me what your role is about. You know, they can go on and on, you know, for days about talking about what they're good at, right? Uh, and then how do we translate that into positioning you as an industry expert, you know, uh, giving you more visibility inside the organization? How can you be in the meeting and express your thoughts without, you know, feeling that you can't do so, right? So to me, the most important part is not making them feel that they're bad at something. It's how do we 
bring out the good that they have out there, right? And help them understand that they have that opportunity to be to be themselves. They can be themselves. They just can't be afraid to express. And that's where I said, you know, it doesn't matter to me if it's a woman or a man. It, it's the same thing. You know, you're a woman, you're afraid. Well, let's figure out how not to be afraid, you know? And sometimes men are afraid, right? Sometimes more timid men or they're not confident because they're so good at engineering, like you said before, Eric, but they're not good at con communicating. So how can we get them more comfortable in communicating, in, mm -hmm. in being there a little bit more visible, right? And in, in bringing out what they're good at to, to, for, for everybody else to see in the company, right? So, so that's the goal, you know, obviously don't position me as a master cleaner <laughs> because nobody is going to want to be cleaned up. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think that you have to, you have to find their own, um, their own unique way to develop. Otherwise it's not authentic and it's not sustainable. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this word authentic is very overused these days. You know, um, I remember, and I will tell you a story, uh, when I moved to the United States, so that was 2003 and I started my business in 2020, in 2010. So that's when I started sort of figuring out what networking is, how, how, how this whole thing works, you know, how do I get in front of the right people in the right organizations? Right. And, uh, my, my sole purpose that I put onto myself, uh, because I didn't come from the corporate environment back in Lithuania, I came from, you know, completely different upbringing and my world was TV, right? So I didn't have the understanding of corporate, uh, the way it was back then. Um, I realized one thing that a lot of these leaders or a lot of these people in the companies, they were just hiding behind these walls. You know, when people say, oh, I work in corporate or I work at, at whatever organization, they think about a bill. Like in my head, it's always like a building of some sorts, right? But there's people in that building. So I realized that back then, 2010, there was not a lot of leaders out there talking, expressing what they think, what they believe, what's driving them, right? And I literally told myself, I really want to humanize those companies because enough of hiding behind the walls, you know? Let's humanize the businesses, let's humanize the companies, let's bring them out. And video was that medium, obviously, that I that I that I worked within, you know, at that time. And um and uh, obviously now it's everybody wants to be out there. Well, I should say a lot more people want to be out <laughs> there, right? But they may not necessarily know how to use these tools of communication just yet. And they need a little bit of that push and coaching, you know, how, how to be effective and, and whichever tool they use. But in the end, you know, um, uh, it's not about changing who you are as a, as a um, executive or as a middle manager or a VP, whichever stage you're in. It's about how do you extract what you believe, what's dri what's driving you, how you want to lead, extract that and start sharing and start showing it so that it feels that, oh, this is how this person makes me feel. That's them. That's their brand. Then that's when you start associating that this is their brand, right? This this mm -hmm. is the type of lead I want to follow. This is the type of, you know, uh, business unit I want to be in if it's led by that person, right? So that's why when sometimes leaders leave, a lot of people follow them, right? Because right. they like working for some of them, right? They don't like the change of some unknown, you know, that they don't necessarily resonate with. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of helping them just get through that barrier, you know, and get to that level, sea level, VP level where they want to be if they're not there yet. Yeah. Wow. There's a, it, it was in an interesting context, that I think is connected to this about, you know, executives and the way they're observed in the workplace mm -hmm. and that recognition of, and the, the phrase was you bring the weather. So mm -hmm. if you walk in the door, whatever energetically is going on with you is what people are going to pick up on. Even if you don't, use words, right? How powerful yeah. the nonverbal communications are and the body language and tone and all of those things. It's far less about the words we use and much more about everything else. And so just having that awareness, right? Of, mm -hmm. of if you're building a brand and you want to, you know, have people feel a certain way in your presence, you, you have to have that self-awareness because if you're just kind of flailing about that's your brand. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And you know, there are so many more coaches that are good at actually executive leadership training. You know, I, I focus solely on communication, visibility, how do we extract that authority right out of you, right? But then there's obviously the whole aspect of leadership specifically training, right? How do you get into that role? How do you lead, right? So that's not what I do. Mine mm -hmm. is always, you know, the lens, <laughs> the lens of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, of, you know, communication and, and visual, right? 
Th- mm-hmm. Those are the two for me go together. And mm-hmm. the communication is 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 the the like the base of it, right? How do you express yourself? How do you present yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the energy is very important. You know, I, I've been around executives who would walk in the room and be like, you know, they're afraid to say something, right? Because it's like, oh my God, now we're going to get, you know, hit. <laughs> and now she's going to say something or he's going to say something, you know, and, and uh, we're all affected by that for the rest of the day. Right. And then mm-hmm. you would have somebody who would walk in the room and it's a, it's, 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 it's respect. It's, it's, you know, understanding it, the, uh, again, we're talking a lot about emotional intelligence, right? that that's important right how do you resonate with somebody right how do you how do you share the experience of where you're at with others to help them grow as well right Mm -hmm. so uh so yeah it's um there's a lot of layers, I guess, when it comes to executive (laughs) presence (laughs) and I cover only one bucket within that within those layers yeah yeah it's important stuff though um and I want to kind of open it up to questions by circling back to a comment that Allison had made in chat uh earlier on and it was about those leaders that when they're communicating, especially tough messages, they tend mm. to water it down. They tend to be a little too mm. nice. Mm. Um, mm. And Al- Allison, I'll, I'll ask you if you don't mind to, to pop off of mute and provide a little context here in, in what you were thinking about when you wrote that comment. Yeah. So we, you know, are in a competitive business. We're in media. We're trying to win dollars from other competitors and whatnot. And, um, you know, we're in a situation where some of our competitors are going out and telling our narrative Mm. incorrectly. And so they're playing hardball, but because we want to rise above it, we're Mm. not being as aggressive as they are. Mm. And so some of our salespeople are like, we got to hit them back. Like we can't let them just be bullish without us being able to actually tell the correct narrative. And so that's kind of the challenge of where like, God bless them. Our corporate legal department is like, no, 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 we have to stay above the line, but what's going to win dollars for us and build revenue as a company Mm -hmm. is being a little more assertive and Mm -hmm. and strong and you can do it with respect, but that's just something that everyone kind of walks on eggshells a little bit. And it is understandable because it's competition, right? I, and again, a lot of organizations have legal departments hushing them, you know, hushing the leadership team or sales team, right? We, we have to adhere to those standards. And that's going back to the story earlier on, like, what's the difference, right? It's, uh, it's, you know, same in media, right? Everybody's badging everybody and nobody gets punished. So same here, right? You know, you hear an ad about BMW, you know, it's, it's, it's ditching down on Mercedes or vice versa, right? While we're above. So somehow this is allowed in the culture of United States communication, like culturally, the communication is just so vastly different that you're just allowed i guess because of the free speech maybe that's why so it's embedded in 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 the in the nature of the culture you know uh but to address specifically you know the aggressiveness the assertiveness um You know, there are probably ways that could be explored in terms of, you know, how your company's message could be relayed. That's not so uh, uh, how to say so not so bluntly out there. But let's say have the executives be invited to different, you know, interviews, right, where they can control the narrative themselves, right, where they can shape the story how they want it to be shaped so that it counteracts against whatever is being written or said about the company, you know, by others. Right. Because. Obviously, others are going to badger. They're going to say a lot of bad things, right? Because they want to win the dollars. Uh, but in the end, only the leader of the company knows what actually that culture and what that message is, right? So you just want to get out of more of that message out there through, you know, content on LinkedIn, their own promotion. What I should, when I say promotion, meaning, uh, 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 you know, sharing messages on behalf of the company on your profiles, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, encouraging employees, you know, just uh, ramp up the better news about the company versus having the, uh, the, the 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 bad news take over. You know, the 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 how to say the SEO, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keywords. Awesome, <clears throat> nice, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, Allison. Thank you, thank you for that question. Any other questions for Loretta? before we start to wind down and head towards dinner time. I have one quick I have a, question. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was wondering, Loretta, if there was any sort of tips that you have just from a physical presence on camera, because I imagine just the way that we hold our bodies or how we sit or, or tone of voice. So what are, I was curious, some of your top tips for kind of physical presence in our communications. Yes. Um, 
Okay. Do you want me to talk about virtual or in-person physical? Because those are slightly different environments. Mm, maybe virtual, just because that's virtual. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you might have observed I'm standing, right? I'm standing. I don't like sitting when I'm, let's say, in something. Here we go. I don't like sitting when, uh, I, you know, in 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 like an, in virtual environment in something that's more official, where I feel it's a little bit more official, right? And in general, let's say, what leaders. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Eric. I sometimes when I express myself, I'm like, here you go, you know, this is what I mean. So mm -hmm. it's it's a much better body language when, especially when you're presenting to the team, let's say a virtual town hall, right? So you have to, you know, zoom in everybody from different parts of the world. And if everybody looks the same, kind of just sitting there, leaning, doing whatever, then it, it, it that energy transfers to the executive or to whoever is presenting, right? So I always encourage executives to stand up. You know, it changes the posture in the virtual environment, it changes the posture. You can use your hands and a lot of a lot of leaders like using their hands. Sometimes they don't know what to do with them, but actually it's really good <laughs> because it is engaging. You know, you 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 express your thoughts and you stress with it, with, you know, with, with some hand gestures or facial expressions. Right. So standing just gives a different feeling energy flow, you know, because you're more active, you're not just sitting, you know, crunched up, you know, and obviously camera positioning, right? The lighting, I, for example, I always advise find the, 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 the area where it's well lit, right? Like I have windows. So if you don't have windows, uh, ring light, you know, something that will light you up so that you don't, again, energetically don't drown the visual too much, right? Um, so so those are the things that are important when it comes to engaging bigger groups of people, you know, where you have to stand out. And of course, there's all the virtual tools right now outside of Zoom, right, that exists where you feel like you're in the same space because it's designed, the virtual environment is designed to feel like you're actually presenting in the center, you know, and all these people are listening in on the sides, right? So it depends also what, what environments and tools are being used inside the organization. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, it's very difficult to engage everybody, but, you know, have somebody monitor the chat, right? Encourage people asking the questions, you know, like Eric is doing a good job. Like he's, he's saying, hey, Allison just said something. Let's return back to it. So have an admin or somebody, you know, in communications department, monitor the chat, you know, collect the, the questions uh, and, and kind of feed them to the, to the presenter, you know, and say, hey, this is the question that came in. They can weave it into that presentation. So it doesn't sound very, very formal, right? It's kind of part of the conversation that he's having or she's having, you know, the audience. Uh, so those would be, would be the, the key things that I normally advise. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Loretta, if people want to engage you and learn more about what you do, where do they find you? And, uh, do you have anything, any gifts for them? things they can download? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Gifts are the best. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So I mentioned early in the show, Loretta.today, Loretta with one T dot today. Uh, you know, you can go there, you can connect with me through the calendar or, uh, you know, download a uh, presence checklist. It has, it's a two part, you know, valid, very valuable document that people can assess either the organizational level presence or their own, you know, executive presence. And if both need to get a little bit of, you know, oomph, then uh, you know where you stand when you collect all those points and you see what you what, what that score looks like right so if you're interested and then um uh share with me that score reaching out you know then we can start the conversation and seeing uh how i can help you so that would be you know the place where i would uh, i would let people uh know to go and and connect with me and i'm on linkedin so whoever wants to connect on linkedin with me i'm there as well you know all, i'm building my own presence on linkedin primarily even though i other platforms exist but they're just noise linkedin <laughs> is a platform for me <laughs> you don't twitter x anymore i uh, no, i don't <laughs> You know, it requires, and that's something actually to your point, it requires when, when you start building your personal brand, it's very important to just pick a platform where you feel, you know, you will resonate the most, you know, you can't be on multiple platforms because they require a slightly different type of content than if you, unless you have somebody delivering that content, you know, on behalf of you, then you'll be spending a lot of time adapting, you know, different snippets, different things, you know, for these different mediums, right? So right. just pick one and if, and just make it a goal to grow your audience or your authority in that one platform, you know? Love yeah. It. Awesome. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, Loretta, for being here with Thank us Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so we much, are, Eric, Laurie, and everybody. We are going to go... Oop, no, Eric, calm down. A little too much applause. Settle down. <laughs> um, we're going to shift into our, our end of show ritual. And Loretta, you are welcome to hang out, but I understand busy executives got stuff to do. So if you yeah. need to go, please feel free. We will get into five minutes of funny things, good feels, and our silly little cocktail, and then head off to dinner. 
You guys are okay. Well, I'll hang around if you don't All mind. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, funny things. Um, <laughs> these are just random things that made me giggle this week. Funny thing number one: bacon is seventy-three percent fat and very salty. Me too, bacon. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> that one's for Ruby. Um, this one is kind of related to something that we made. We made jokes about being of a certain age earlier. Um, once you hit a certain age, life just becomes a delicate balance between trying to stay awake and trying to fall asleep while slowly getting worse at both. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> Funny thing number three is 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 your thinking person's humor today. We're going back to Greek mythology. Takes place in a bar. In walks Sisyphus, whiskey bartender. On the rocks, Sisyphus, buddy. It's been a long day. I'm not in the mood. <laughs> For those of you Wait, not familiar I don't get with that Greek one. mythology, Sisyphus was <laughs> I don't get condemned. That one was condemned in his uh, by Hades in his internal damnation to forever push a rock up a hill. Mm, oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Got it. No more rocks. <clears throat> <laughs> there it is, folks. Your college humor for the day. Um, we're going to take it down a notch now. This is yes. your demotivation you. posters category here. Shoot for the moon. If you miss, here's a gentle reminder that the moon's diameter is 3,475 <laughs> kilometers. You could not have fucked this up more. <laughs> My favorite funny thing is one that's going to hit close to home to all of us HR talent and uh, uh, IO psych types. Quiz. Are you even good enough to have imposter syndrome? <laughs> I saw this one. <laughs> and this this girl looks so much like my oldest daughter right now. I was now. just gonna say that's so Eva. Looks just like Eva. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, today's good feel story. I uh, I I don't know. I say Steve Hartman makes us cry every week. I started crying about two minutes, uh, about a minute into this one. So buckle up, everybody. Here you go. <laughs> CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a story about how old friends and an old car gave one man a new lease on life. Texas. So good. Just do Aww. good stuff today. Just do yeah. good. Stuff. I love it. I mean, come on. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I need to recollect myself. <laughs> <laughs> My dad, the gearhead, used to fix up cars all the time for people. Oh yeah, not to that extent, but yeah. That was that was a good looking Mustang. That was a good looking. Yeah, Mustang. yeah it was. I know it's Lori likes the '60s ones better than the '70s ones, but that was that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. Pretty, it's pretty tight. All right, today's <laughs> semi quarantine cocktail is called "Hey, it's friggin' maple." <laughs> It's a riff on the maple bourbon smash cocktail. So there's a new home for your favorite pancake topping, you know, maple syrup, and you're going to need a little bit of that to make this drink. Uh, the sugar content in these trees is significantly lower than the Vermont sugar maples, and it takes a, a little bit more work to get it out and a little bit more volume to make the same amount of syrup. You're going to need some fresh orange juice. This has a slightly smoky taste from the cooking process. Lemon juice, bitters, and bourbon. Um, this syrup is produced in the great state of New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, one producer said, back in the 80s, no one would buy it. They said things like, I get my syrup from Vermont. New Jersey, it just can't even be good. <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. I don't know about you, but I love me some maple syrup. And, you know, um, just the thought of getting syrup that tastes like Newark doesn't... <laughs> light up my taste buds, but um, I'm an open-minded guy, and I'm willing to give it a shot. Thank That's you. Funny. For awesome. today. Thanks to Loretta for hanging out with us Thank today, you. And telling us how to up our game with executive presence. We will see you next week with Dean Innes. You guys have a great rest of your week. Have good dinners, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. 
Thanks again, and remember, you've always got friends at The Corporate Bartender.